In the year 1908, when work began on this, the Liver Building, the city of Liverpool was at the peak of its power. The city bristled with imposing civic monuments, gleaming office blocks and a seven-mile swathe of docks. The liver birds on the building's towers look down on Britain's greatest port, the maritime heart of the largest empire the world had ever seen. Because this was no mere provincial Lancastrian town, not even just a British city. This was once the most innovative, ambitious and diverse place in the world. Liverpool was the first truly global city. But only 300 years ago, Liverpool was a small town of just seven streets huddled on the banks of a stream, the liver, meaning muddy, pool. So how did this funny little out-of-the-way place next to a muddy pool turn into the world's greatest port city? As Liverpool undergoes a massive archaeological dig, we're delving deep beneath the city to reveal its first ever dock the revolutionary enterprise that put Liverpool firmly on the map. <music> Liverpool was founded in the year 1207 at the narrowest point of the Mersey estuary. For 500 years, it was an insignificant Lancastrian town with its seven streets on the banks of an inlet, the Liver Pool. And then, from early in the 18th century, Liverpool's fortunes took a dramatic turn. A frenzy of investment and construction turned this small town into one of the most important cities in the world. For nearly 300 years, the secrets of this incredible transformation have lain hidden beneath the city's streets. While Liverpool prepares for its year as European capital of culture in 2008, we can finally unlock its past. Investigating the landscape. It's difficult to get to, it's got a strong tidal range, it's difficult to load and unload when you're there. Exploring the buildings which made Liverpool great. Every surface is about conspicuous wealth and it's about the aspirations of Liverpudlians who've got a city unconstrained by the past. And most importantly, following the archaeology as it unfolds. On the waterfront, the construction of a new museum and a canal link has already uncovered one of Liverpool's earliest docks. At a second site, the area is being cleared to make way for new development. And somewhere beneath the rubble, archaeologists hope to explore a long-vanished dockside settlement. But the biggest prize, Liverpool's first ever dock, lies beneath this, the billion-pound, 42-acre Paradise Project. This is a massive site. It's probably the biggest archaeological site we've ever filmed on Time Scene. How big is it? It's 42 and a half acres, 17 and a half hectares. Said to be one of the biggest of its kind in, in Europe. We've always been uh, conscious from day one. We're revitalising it, kick-starting it again at the very place where it all began. So what's going to be here? Houses, 600 homes, new home for Radio BBC Merseyside, new home for the Quakers, cinema, could go on. What would you like to get out of this? Well, we're really hoping to look at the site of Liverpool's first dock and all the associated things that go with it. Imports, exports, trade, you know, bits, pots, pans, everything like that. This isn't really your kind of archaeology, is it, Phil? You're going to have to hang around in a big city. I know, but I think I'm going to live with it. I mean, I really will. I mean, this development represents the future of Liverpool. What we need to know is the past of Liverpool as well, and the past is underneath that development. When this was redeveloped in the 70s, they didn't really care about the archaeology. They take it away. Now people do care about the archaeology and they care about the roots of this wonderful city. It's worldwide too, it's those trading routes, yes. those influences and the influence that that dock yeah. had on, on docks throughout the world. Yeah. When Liverpool's first dock was created in 1709, it was revolutionary. 
a commercial wet dock, constantly full of water, surrounded by a quayside where goods could be handled. With gates to lock in thousands of tonnes of water, ships could load and unload all year round, all day and all night long. Whatever the weather, whatever the tides. Unfortunately, its building plans were lost in a fire in the 19th century. But now, archaeologists have a unique opportunity to unlock its secrets and have already uncovered a fraction of its monumental brick walls. You know, this is a phenomenal war. I mean, it is groundbreaking technology. It's bricks in the early 18th century. I think that's possibly what it's about. They wanted to have the best, the most expensive quality medium on their prize winning their fantastic dock. That's why they use brick. Construction's not very good though, is it? It's pretty poor and you have to see that. There's irregularities in the way it's constructed. You don't seem to have a great deal of pattern. Some places it's simply alternate header and stretch and some places there's absolutely no pattern at all. But at the same time, I mean, they simply didn't have the skilled brickies to put it up. But I think you also need to bear in mind, this was in use for almost up like 100 years and perhaps it's not surprising that a structure like this would need an awful lot of repair work. And you can see this all the way. There are patches of repair literally all the way across the masonry. But it's hardly surprising though, is it? I mean, let's be honest, this is a wet environment, it's a dock. You've got very, very soft mortar, which is going to erode with the water. These bricks too, probably not very highly fired, they will er uh, degrade as well. You've got ships banging into it, this thing is bound to fall down, it's bound to need repair. I think that's exactly what's the case, and over a hundred years I think you'll find the whole sections will have come away. Still a phenomenal wall. It's a phenomenal wall. At first glance, the brickwork may look poor, but really, it confirms just how pioneering and experimental Liverpool's first dock was. But why did a small town on the west coast of England invest so much effort in such a revolutionary enterprise? To find out, we're commissioning specialist hydraulic engineers to construct a working scale model, and they're starting from scratch with the natural topography of that muddy pool into which the dock was built. Until the 18th century, Liverpool was a provincial backwater, 200 miles from London and overshadowed by Chester, the successful port just down the road. Its muddy, shallow pool had always been a handicap, but it faced another problem, which was much bigger and much harder to overcome, the River Mersey. At the beginning of the 21st century, Liverpool is undergoing a massive urban transformation. Beneath the construction, archaeologists are uncovering the city's 18th century past, and at its core, a lost technological wonder of the industrial age, Liverpool's first ever dock. This dock catapulted Liverpool from a tiny backwater into a global city. We're finding out why this happened and how it took the city on a tempestuous journey, centred around the River Mersey. Liverpool owes its very existence to the River Mersey. It was built on its narrowest crossing point and there's been a ferry here for over 800 years since it first linked the city with Birkenhead Priory on the other side. Nowadays, the crossing only takes a few minutes, but in the days of the sailing ships, these were dangerous and unpredictable waters. Any skipper aboard a, a, a ship coming in here would would have a chart, but presumably they would also have to, to know the waters really oh, well, yes, is that they right? Would, yeah. What they had to do is they had to attempt to uh, enter this dangerous little channel. You took a, a transit line on those two beacons, crossed your fingers and carried on. <laughs> that is almost a right angle. That looks like a, an incredibly tight turn to me. Incredibly difficult in a ship this sort of thing. Oh, yes. Not only have you had to come and do a dog leg down here amongst all these sandbanks, then come up a narrow channel up here, fast flowing water, high tidal range. When you get to the pool, you've got, you've got to dock as well. You've got, you've got to load and unload. Yeah, what they had to do was load everything onto barges, uh, lighters, they're mm -hmm. called. And then those lighters had to go inshore and be 
grounded up the beach to unload the cargo oh, from okay. them. So that's just going backwards and forwards, backwards and again forwards. very costly and inefficient oh, presumably. Yes. And long winded, I mean you might spend several times trying to right. unload. That, that waste of time is waste of money presumably, even yes, in, even in yeah. those days. And, and the weather could turn on you. There are so many variables in it that you couldn't reliably run it as, uh, as commerce. The Mersey's fast flowing waters and vast tidal range meant it was difficult to navigate. And when ships finally did reach Liverpool to load and unload, they faced another obstacle, the muddy pool. And now that the first stage of our model has been completed, it's clear why this liver pool was not a natural harbour. Jane, I thought we'd commissioned a model of the foreshore at Liverpool. I've been there. This looks nothing at all like Liverpool. You're going to need a bit of imagination here, Phil, so I brought a map to help. Uh, this is a, a mid-17th century map. This is just the area we're looking at here where the old dock was constructed. I can see there's boats in there, but there's no water in there. It must be incredibly shallow. By the beginning of the 18th century, when the old dock was constructed, everything was entirely silted up and all you had was a narrow creek running down the middle of it. So if this is what it's like at low tide, can we make it high tide? Absolutely. At least the boats are floating. Only just. Um, this one's actually got ballast in, or simulating ballast, and that one's actually still bottomed. So the creek is, is, is well and truly silted up. The boats can get in, but only just. This is not good news for Liverpool. It's not good news at all, because there's now a new trade. At the end of the 17th century, uh, they're starting to bring tobacco uh, from America, and this is a valuable cargo, and they want to be able to load and unload it safely. I know this is probably my prejudice as a southerner, but it does seem as though Liverpool was a pretty daft place to build a dock. You've got that really difficult, navigable entrance into it. You have to build the dock itself in a muddy pool. And there really aren't very many people living around here at that time, are there? No, in many senses you could say it was a, a daft decision, but what an incredibly wonderful entrepreneurial risk that somebody was prepared to take at that stage, because geography was not kind to it, but it did have links into Lancashire, Cheshire, Staffordshire, areas which were developing where you could build up a very important internal trade on vital commodities like salt and coal and so on, so that Liverpool, looking to be out on a limb, actually is very, very well placed to have a port when an industrial revolution starts off in those adjacent areas. OK, it's strategically well placed for the internal trade, but how about anywhere else? Well, there's the Great Atlantic Ocean, and this is... Timing, again, is crucial, because the new world is really coming to its own at this time. So you want to be on the West Coast. And Liverpool, having invested more than those rather sleepy other ports on the West Coast, is able to exploit a comparative advantage and become the great Western Emporium of Albion and control the Atlantic and the oceans beyond that. So it's not a coincidence that the whole floor of this place is dominated by a great big compass. Indeed, that, that Liverpool, this little place, out on a limb, not on the high road to anywhere, suddenly becomes the real centre of the trading universe, that anywhere, everywhere, Liverpool can send ships. You become the gateway of empire. At the turn of the 18th century, Liverpool was perfectly positioned to exploit new trade opportunities, but first it had to build a dock. In order to create this dock, you needed first-class engineers, but to get it built, you had to have more than a few plans and calculations. You needed imagination, vision and sheer energy. So who provided that? Who raised the money and where did it come from? The answer lies at Liverpool's magnificent town hall, built by Liverpool's Merchant Corporation with the profits from the dock in the 18th century. You can see here the council of the corporation ordering that Sir Thomas Johnson and Richard Norris Esquire, the representatives in Parliament for this corporation, be desired and empowered to treat with and agree for a proper person to come to this town and view and draw a plan of the intended dock. And that man was Thomas Steers, who we think had worked on the Rotherhide 
dock, the Great Howland Dock, some miles up the Thames. And they actually need £6,000 yes, to do that. Yes, that's about the only thing I can actually see there, <laughs> 6000 I can't As read the rest at all. Not exceeding £6,000. So they're mortgaging the whole city for one dock? Yes, and here we see in 1720, they're actually mortgaging all of the lands of the town, all the corporation lands, uh, including the shambles, the butcher's shambles, mm -hmm. everything, in order to raise a further sum of £10,000 from a gentleman in London. What would have happened if it had failed? The history of Liverpool would have been entirely different. I suppose it would all have gone to the gentleman in London. It would have done. And we don't know who he was. We don't. Oh, how tantalising. We don't. We know he was paid back. <laughs> That's good. The creation of the first dock was a risky venture into the unknown. But it wasn't just a financial gamble, it was a massive technical challenge, as the archaeologists are beginning to find out. What on earth is this, Jamie? I'm up, this has just come up literally within the last 10, 15 minutes. It's actually quite remarkable. Now, then, let, before we get too carried away, let's get some sort of sense of where we are. We got up there, we got the brickwork of the dock. That's right. And then what's this? this? Is this the natural bedrock here? This is the sandstone bedrock, red sandstone bedrock. So that comes down and then it's sort of stepped out. That's right. Now, is this blocks, laid blocks of sandstone, or is this the actual this natural? Is, this is the actual natural sandstone. You know, you've got these lovely tool marks They're fantastic, in there. That's aren't gorgeous, they? isn't it, really? They clearly spend an awful lot of effort trying to get a very good, very regular worked face here. And you have this, this, uh, this arch thing. That's what on earth do you think incredible. it is? What we've been finding elsewhere in the site is there have been absolute passages running through the bedrock that were accessed by deep wells. Have you got... Give us a shovel a minute. Feel free. I can always do another <laughs> pair of hands. <laughs> but that's a layer of bricks there, look. I'm wondering very, very tentatively whether or not we could have um, a rock-cut tunnel at this stage. If you've seen these elsewhere, how yes. far do they go back in? Well, we found them literally running for perhaps three or 400 metres to the north of this wall. Presumably, we don't know if there's a possible to have a flow through here because at high tide, this is going to be permanently underwater, but at low tide, it could equally be permanently underwater. Yeah. This could be totally water-filled. I mean, the other possibility, could it be for me getting material out? Could we actually be dealing with sewage here? I just wonder how stable all this lot is. Well, I've got considerable concerns. You've got uh, the wall, which is sitting on the bedrock, and inside there, you've got this massive damaged area, then you've got this aperture underneath. I have to say I'm worried, and as soon as I'm finished from here, we're going to be going and propping that up to make sure it's stable. Yeah. The construction and funding of the first dock were groundbreaking, but the gamble paid off, transforming the fortunes of Liverpool. Remarkably, 300 years later, its legacy can still be seen within the modern street plan. Where we're walking now, Stuart, is called Whitechapel, but it's the old location, the tidal pool of Liverpool that came right from the waterfront, right up towards the museum there. So in the medieval period, we would literally have been walking up the bed of a stream. We would have been getting a bit wet, yes. Right. And it's quite interesting. So we're actually walking up, up Whitechapel here. It's actually curved like a stream course, isn't it? Uh, but when you look at this area to the west of Whitechapel, we've got this tight, regular grid of streets, Chapel Street, Tithe Barn Street, Castle Street. I mean, that smacks of being the medieval centre of Liverpool with that, that layout. Yes, uh, and the streets were really laid out by the early 13th century as a planned town. Very much an H-block type plan. Right. Uh, and that's definitely the earliest core of the city where all the trading took place. But that's actually very different when you look at the modern map. When you look at the, the east side of Whitechapel, what you've got is all these streets all starting to point in now. It's like a spider's web and they're all the streets are pointing in towards Chivas Park. That's the site of Liverpool's first dock. So what you're looking at in the street pant here is almost a complete change. The streets are developing off that dock to do with the merchant trading, new dwellings, industries, uh, rope making moving into the area and also the shape of the streets very much reflect those types of industries with long alleyways for rope manufacturing. Completely different layout to the early medieval town. Very fast expanding city. The creation of the first dock sparked an era of colossal development all over the city. And the archaeologists are now finding more evidence of that urban expansion. Right beneath the surface, they've discovered the foundations of a long lost dockside community called Nova Scotia. 
once home to Liverpool's sailors, dockers and traders. Well, Stone of Crows, you've got brickwork everywhere here, haven't you? Yes. You've got housing that was constructed on sort of a, a certain amount of land, new land that was occupied in Nova Scotia. I mean, some of the walls aren't particularly well built and there's a certain amount of shot in its construction. No set of steps going up there. So this is probably basement, is it? <laughs> I suppose it's somebody's house, really. I wonder who they were. It's somebody's house, but it would have had multifunction. I mean, you'd be talking about uh, warehousing, you'd be talking about housing, you'd be talking about people living in the cellars, you'd have been having uh, workshops. It would have been all, all multifunction. And, and, I mean, a nice patch in there. I mean, I don't know whether that's ashes or whether that's just basically the coal hole that's been flung in there. So it's a, a, a very, what should we say, low level of life, really, then? Low level in the sense that they're below ground, definitely. <laughs> so what happens outside the house? Well, as you can see, we're actually now technically outside the basement, but, again, we're constructed on sort of very poor reclaimed ground and there's ash and uh, slag and enormous amount of material that's actually th is constructed upon. Don't look much of a quality of brickwork. Oh, that's no so. Uh, isn't that fantastic? Can you see those absolutely remarkable tip lines? So that's literally individual cart loads of stuff being tipped in. It's made up ground. It's completely made up ground. Then on the top here, you've got your, your brick floor. It's, it's a fantastic floor, isn't it? That's nice, isn't it, eh? Come, on, come in here. Whee! And then you've got the wall standing up on either side. We, we're actually probably going to be internal at this point. You can actually see that we've got a, a plaster face there and a plaster face on that wall, so we're actually probably looking like a large internal structure. I tell you what, seeing all this here show, just brings it home to you, the density of occupation of buildings. I mean, you've got, you've got buildings and walls over there, buildings through here, buildings over there, buildings over there, it's massive buildings. This is basically almost like a bordering on being an entirely squalor of a, of a small internally built up urban area. There's huge numbers of people living, working in this area. Now only the foundations of Nova Scotia remain, but buildings like these once dominated Liverpool. And there are still a few hidden amongst the modern city. So this warehouse here is part of a 19th century pocket of industrial Liverpool. Yes, Liverpool was essentially about moving goods from the port and into storage and then out of storage and back through the port. But that door looks domestic. Yeah, I think this door would have been used by the warehouse man whose job it was to keep an eye on the building. Um, and you, it would have led to a small spiral staircase up inside. And you can see that the staircase is lit by these small oval barred windows, just enough to admit some light, but to prevent anybody who didn't have business there getting access to the building. So right the way up there, you've got this, you've got this big central opening, haven't you, with the rounded engineering brick on the corner, presumably to take a knock from the That's goods. right. This is where goods would have been hoisted up the outside of the building. You can see at the top where the pulley would have been housed under that shelter. But originally, uh, in this central uh, part of the building, there would be timber doors at each floor which would open inwards and um, goods being delivered to the warehouse could be hoisted up the outside of the building and then taken in at any level through those double doors. Warehouses shaped the skyline of Liverpool as the docks profited throughout the 18th and 19th centuries. Hundreds sprang up to store the incoming and outgoing goods which passed through the port. At the waterfront site, the archaeologists are finding evidence of these goods. Goods which made Liverpool rich, but only thanks to a trade that caused suffering for millions, the slave trade and it changed the shape and the fortunes of the city forever. As Liverpool undergoes a massive regeneration, the city has become one mammoth dig, the biggest archaeological investigation Time Team's ever witnessed, revealing the warehouses, homes and commodities of its maritime past. Most importantly, under the mass of construction, archaeologists have found Liverpool's first dock, the 18th century venture which kick-started 200 years of wealth and prosperity. The archaeologists have spent months removing tons of earth from the dock to expose the secrets of its brick construction. Now that the walls are exposed, they're having to protect it from the elements. As they finally uncover the bottom of the dock, and reveal its full profile. Jamie, we're actually on the bottom of the dock. We are indeed. It's fantastic, isn't it? And you can actually see the way the sandstone terraces up towards the actual edge of the dock wall. 
But that doesn't go all the way up, does it? The actual profile of the dock means that it comes straight down and the terracing is only at the bottom. Why do you think That's that right. is? Well, I think basically what you've got, and they're allowed for the shape of the hulls. But is, is, is a boat sitting in this dock gonna, gonna actually bump on the bottom of the dock? I mean, the whole point about it is the level of the water being kept constant by the gate at the entrance of the dock. So, in the original boats, they probably wouldn't have had a problem. But later on, the boats got bigger and then it became an issue and they were bottoming. But deck level on the boat, when the actual dock was full up with water, the deck level of the boat is right up there and really just take cargo straight off the deck, That's straight onto the The intention the was that simply you had nothing more than planks in order to gain access between the boat and the quayside. The archaeology has revealed both the fabric and the shape of the dock, but a vital piece of evidence is still missing the gates which kept the water in. But by the waterfront, the archaeologists have uncovered another dock, built 75 years later, called the Manchester Dock. Its gates have survived almost perfectly, and so give a real sense of how the earlier first dock gates might have looked. With all this data, we can finally build up a complete picture of the first dock. What's more, using this information, we've been able to complete our scientific model to understand how it functioned when thousands of ships passed through its gates. Cool, this has come on since the last saw it. We've actually got our fully working dock. The Mersey's out there, the Tidy's out, but the crucial thing is the dock is full up and it's working. Uh, the whole point about these boats needs to be level with the quayside to help loading and unloading, and that's what we're seeing here. I mean, I must confess, when I first saw it, I thought it's a bit puny. <laughs> well, that's what I thought, because, I mean, I've been to Liverpool and I've seen those massive great walls there. And I saw this and I realised that this red line literally represents those walls. This is to scale. Just goes to show just what a whacking great structure it was. I mean, when you consider the bit that we've actually got exposed in Liverpool at the moment is only that tiny little bit there. Yeah, it's quite a phenomenal dock. I mean, now that you can see the whole thing in its entirety, can you actually use this to calculate how much water is in there? It's about 65,000 tonnes. That is an awful lot. That is a hell of a lot. You know, I know, when we talked to you the last time, you said one of the crucial things about designing this thing was would you be able to design a dock that would hold water? How have you resolved that? That's right. Come and have a look. Well, you can see the lock here. Um, we've constructed a, a, a lock gate system which is based on a relatively simple canal. Um, you can see there's a, a minimal amount of leakage out of uh, this model. At the moment, you, we could uh, suggest that maybe 10% of the water leaks out. Um, and the other issue is that we may have a stream coming in at the far end which may top the, the basin up. We don't actually know for certain that there was that feeder in. Could this actually work without that? I think so. Um, maybe we're looking at two to three feet of movement of the water over sort of the high tide range. Uh, no problem at all. Liverpool could now trade like nowhere else in the UK. And on the bed of the Manchester dock, the archaeologists have discovered remarkable evidence of the wealth of goods which began to stream in and out of the port. Rob, this is a wonderful range of finds. It's extraordinary, isn't it? And it mm. beautifully exemplifies Liverpool's role as a major port in Britain around about 1800. There's a, a range of pottery here that's come in from Staffordshire, one or two pieces that are probably locally made in Liverpool, but almost all of that destined for export to the Americas, to perhaps Africa, to the Caribbean. So is there anything here that you can identify as being made for one particular market? There's one very obvious example of that, and this is the top of a chamber pot. Right. And this is a piece from lower down, uh, and you can see that piece has the image of George III. Oh, yes, I can see his face, yes. Yeah. Isn't it a bit traitorous to have him on a chamber pot? Well, this was made for the American market. Ah, and after the War of Independence. So, so you can imagine the Americans taking great delight uh, in uh, using this chamber pot for its original function. I'm just amazed that anybody was even allowed to make it in this country. <laughs> These clay tobacco pipes were intended for export as well. This is uh, a, a pipe intended for the American market. You can see the heel on some of these. This is, a, this is a one intended for British consumption. Yeah. But this one lacks that heel. So it's just a different fashion? 
It is, yes, it is. So where's the pipe clay coming from? Because that's not uh, local to Liverpool, is it? No, it isn't. No, the pipe clay is coming from the southwest of England. It's as if Liverpool's sitting in the middle of this web of, of raw materials and finished products going in and out, and it's very complicated. It is, and that's what makes Liverpool so interesting. And something that illustrates that again is this very f interesting piece of pottery with the W. Ashcroft stamp on it. Oh, yes. And the Ashcrofts were producing pottery for Liverpool for the sugar industry. So this is a sugar mould, and it goes like this. This is actually the bottom. This is the top. So the mould would originally have stood something like that kind of size. So it's huge. These are big pots, yeah, very, very heavy as well. Mm. And the base of the mould uh, would have st stood something like that. And how is it used? Well, the sugar was poured in as a very hot juice mm -hmm. into the top of the, the big mould. The molasses drained out of this hole in, in the bottom and that drains out into the syrup jar, leaving in the sugar mould a sugar loaf. It's a very evocative object, isn't it, thinking that so much of Liverpool's wealth was, was, was essentially made using one of these. In the 18th century, goods like sugar made Liverpool rich as they began to flood into the port. Of all the sugar imported for European consumption, 80% was devoured by the British public. It's such a beautifully English place, isn't it? The genteel tea room with tea and sugar. So how important was sugar to ports like Liverpool? Well, it really affected the city at all kinds of different levels. You had kind of big, heavy industry in terms of the refineries around, around the docks. And then you had sugar going into kind of different levels of commercial culture, if you like. So you've got high-class confectioners, beautiful kind of Georgian bow window shops, full of really special glistening sweetmeats, which are kind of handmade. And then from really the 19th century, we begin to get these sort of mid-range sweet shops, which are selling like lemon drops and little, much cheaper sweets. Um, and then you start also getting people who are just buying a bag of sugar and doing it as a kind of cottage industry. So what have we got here? Well, we've got um, lots of beautiful sweets. We've got boiled sweets like this. These are pear drops and acquired taste. They've got that slightly funny flavour, haven't yeah. they? Yeah. I think I've learned to love them over the years. But they are a kind of uh, version of higher class sweets, if you like, which was real fruit, real pears and real oranges, which was candied. Um, and that goes back to the medieval period. This is a rhubarb and custard, which is my favourite sweet. <laughs> <laughs> You've got these lovely sourness and astringency of the rhubarb here, and then the beautiful creamy custard on the other side. I've never heard anybody talk about a boiled sweet with such love before. <laughs> But Britain's sugar lust was dependent on a terrible partnership, slavery. The triangular trade of shipping sugar and tobacco into Liverpool, goods out to Africa and slaves to the Americas left an indelible imprint on the city. There was one famous old drunken actor, 18th century actor George Frederick Cook, who was hissed and booed off stage in Liverpool, but ran back on to say, I have not come here to be insulted by a set of wretches whose infernal city is cemented by the blood of Africans. So which buildings are blood-stained with African blood? This building here, Haywood's Bank, yeah. the owner not only had plantations in the West Indies, but also was involved in actual slave trade, shipping slaves from the Africa to the West Indies. And they made a lot of money? They were fabulously rich. One particular uh, trip they did, they made £4,000, which is something like £127,000 in our money. So with all the banks up and down this road? Most of the banks along here, this is Brunswick Street yeah. and Castle Street, would have been built on the slave trade. <laughs> But slavery didn't just leave its mark on Liverpool's financial centre. The whole city was cemented together with its profits. A legacy still evident throughout the streets. The interesting thing about the cavern is, as near as we can get to the original site of Gildart Sugar Refinery. And what's that got to do with slavery? The Gildarts had every end sewn up because they owned slave ships, they had plantations in the West Indies, and they refined the product of the West Indies 
on this site. It's now known famously as Matthew Street because it was called after a slave ship captain, Captain Matthew. So are there many streets in Liverpool that have still got echoes of the slave trade? There certainly are, Tony. One of the most famous streets I can think of is probably the famous Penny Lane. Penny Lane was short, called after James Penny, a slave ship captain who was one of the delegates who went down to the House of Parliament to speak in favour of the slave trade. That's amazing, isn't it, to think that there are so many streets of still... All of them, every one of them, practically. <laughs> but while the city profited from the misery of over a million enslaved Africans, its commercial prosperity drew in a myriad of willing immigrants eager to capitalise on the growing opportunities. The result was Britain's most multicultural city, with the oldest Chinese settlement in Europe, lavish synagogues, the first mosque in Britain, and communities from all over the world. At the old dockside settlement site of Nova Scotia, the archaeologists have found evidence of this expanding population. And they're hoping to get a picture of the early dockside living conditions. These are some wonderful single-cell terrace houses, I must admit. Beautiful basements here, but dating-wise, they clearly weren't shown on the 7065 map. So what date are we reckoning they are? Well, this little interesting selection of domestic dwellings that we've got here basically show up quite nicely on the 1803 map. And as you can see, we've got this division now within the building shows each house with its corresponding number. So they're probably going to be late 18th century, aren't they? Definitely a design and the material. You can see a mixture of surfaces. You've got sort of sandstone there where there'll be a doorway, lintel. You've got brick surfaces, cobbled surfaces, which may be external or they may be internal. Well, certainly that, that would look on the plan to be an external yard. Yeah, it? definitely. It looks like a little front yard of some description. The archaeologists can now make out the individual buildings which made up Nova Scotia, but can they identify the people who lived and worked in them? Kaz, what activity can you see there? We've got brick floors with worn pathways suggesting you know, how often people were coming in and out of the rooms. We've got uh, little fireplaces and then cobbled courtyards, which we've got at the back here. That's just a footprint. What about the people? A good example would be number seven, which is marked on this map here and has been excavated, was actually the home of William Francis, who was a vittler, according to the street directory, and also ran the new ferry boathouse. And we know that he was charging tuppence for market passengers there and sixpence for people of superior means to make the crossing. That does look pretty higgledy-piggledy. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it was a, a very busy working dock front. You would have had an anchor smith living next door to a cor corn merchant. You might have then had a coffee house uh, where merchants would have met to discuss commercial business. So there was an enormous amount of activity going on. It was a pulsing port. The new communities were testament to Liverpool's 18th century success. In the hundred years after the creation of the first dock, the population shot up from little more than 5,000 to over 77,000. But accommodating all these people and trades presented the city planners with a problem, finding the space to grow. Liverpool's waterfront is dominated by buildings like this, a magnificent legacy of the past. But What's so extraordinary is that 300 years ago, not only were these buildings not here, but the ground that they're built on wasn't here either. If I'd have been here, I'd have been walking on water. Because in the 18th and 19th century, as trade exploded, Liverpool realised that it would have to expand. But it was sandwiched between the hills and the water. So that was going to provide the city with its greatest challenge yet. For months, archaeologists have been digging up Liverpool, uncovering the engineering triumphs that created an era of wealth and growth for the city. We've witnessed the explosion of new docks, warehousing and settlements which sprang up in the 18th and 19th centuries. We're now keen to find out how Liverpool achieved this massive urban expansion, finding the land to develop on. We're standing at the Strand, which is a main thorough 
thoroughfare through Liverpool yeah. at the junction of, of Water Street, but I see no water. Uh, <laughs> Where are we in relation to the early medieval layout of Liverpool? We're right on the edge of the aptly named Water Street, because had we gone any further, we'd have been getting quite wet. You can see on the map here the sort of old shoreline of 1725 is exactly where we are. So we're at one of the key sides uh, at the bottom of the old city, right along the River Mersey. As it was, what you see in front of you is completely the reclaimed land coming off the strand, the three iconic gr three graces there, the buildings. The Mersey hasn't moved, the land's been reclaimed. Right. So the reclamation has really been virtually uh, dictated by the expansion of the dock systems, really starting um, from southwards here and moving northwards right up the Mersey. Building more docks and expanding the quayside meant the city had to reclaim vast stretches of land from the Mersey and then keep the river at bay. Between the modern waterfront and the Liver building, the archaeologists have found evidence of how the engineers overcame this monumental challenge. Well, it's a bit of an obstacle course to get here, but it's certainly worth it when you are here. What, what is this wall? This is one of the early sea defences. It's the original river wall, basically. It's an earlier version of what the ships are mooring up against today, the Mersey Ferry. How, how far can you trace it? Well, we've traced it right the way along the length of the canal link, which has been dug so far, so over 120 metres. So are we actually physically below the River Mersey now? At the moment we are, yeah, the tide's up today. And it's only the modern equivalent of this wall that's keeping the water back? Yep, the modern equivalent of that wall is stopping billions of gallons of Mersey from pouring in here, and I'm sure this would have done an equally good job in its time as well. In some places it's over two and a half metres thick. Um, it does step out, you can see there's a slight step to each stone as we go down the bottom. You can see it stepping out again here as well. The thing that strikes me is that this is made out of stone, but the dock that I've been used to seeing is made out of brick. Well, the old dock is kind of a, stands alone in its sort of construction because it was the first one of its kind. It was very much an experimental object and then realized later on that it would be much more efficient if instead of having 50 bricks, you could have one massive piece of stone. The sea walls meant that Liverpool could expand into the Mersey and gradually 30 further docks stretched out seven miles along the river. Profits from these docks gave rise to a wave of opulent buildings, architectural statements of civic pride cloaked in classical splendour. By the 19th century, Liverpool was Britain's second city. It was rich, it was influential, it was teeming with life. 40% of all the world's trade passed through its docks. It was home to more millionaires than anywhere else outside London. The corporation's great gamble, the building of the first dock, had paid off. And Joseph, every... Good self-respecting city's got its civic monuments. This is as grand as they come. Yes, it's as good as anything you might find in Europe, um, Berlin or Paris, I suppose, would be the obvious comparisons. So what's St George's Hall actually for? It's not the town hall, is it? It's a combination of law courts and a public hall for assemblies and concerts and that kind of thing. And it was conceived in the 1830s. Until this point, Liverpool had just been obsessed with making money and all the largest buildings in the town were devoted to that end. And it was really only in the 1830s that they decided to start devoting some of those resources from their commerce to higher values, to culture. And that's how this building came about. I like the way you can either be jailed or entertained in one, in one building, maybe on the same night if it, <laughs> if it goes badly. Let's get inside and have a look, Joey. Fast like stepping into ancient Rome. In the 19th century, St George's Hall was the ultimate symbol of Liverpool's confidence in its own greatness. By the early 20th century, even more splendid buildings sprang up along the waterfront as Liverpool reached the peak of its power. The Three Graces looked out to America as the city profited from another trade, mass migration. Dreaming of a fresh start, five and a half million Europeans emigrated to America by 1900. And 80% of them passed through Liverpool. 
Now, as Liverpool plans for a new beginning, its first dock is finally being preserved for the future. Jamie, there's a great big concrete lid on it. When did that happen? Oh, well, this has happened in the last two months. Where would I have been standing if I was here in 1720? Up there. Oh, I'd be underwater. <laughs> no, you would be underground because we're now at the back side of the wall. This is the key side of the wall. So the water would be over here. That's right. And if I could see through, then the hulls of the boats would be, would be above me over there somewhere. That's right. And they'd be unloading onto the key side here and then taking out to the warehouses, which would have been in that direction. I have to say this archaeology has been great fun, but have we actually learnt anything from it? Oh, enormous amount. We lost almost all documents. We had almost no indication of how things were constructed. But what we've actually learned is how it was built, how it's constructed, its means of, of using the brick, the fact it had sandstone coping, the fact it used the bedrock. So we've actually learned an enormous amount about how it's constructed. Bearing in mind this is one of the earliest closed wet docks were ever constructed. But and this, that... surely, if you're not careful, is, is the mistake that you're going to fall into. We're in danger of taking this, this wonderful dock in isolation what you've got to remember is that this dock is, is forms one part of, of the much bigger site itself of Liverpool. You've got the later docks, the later yeah. buildings, the later warehouses, the seafronts, the places where people were living. And it marks then the development of Liverpool from this into something that is so much bigger. Phil, there can't be many cities where you can look at the archaeology and say, this was the very birth of this city. Liverpool's first dock was revolutionary. Its innovative brick construction, gated entrance and commercial quayside enabled the city to trade 365 days a year, 24-7. The story of the old dock mirrors the story of the city. The energy, ambition and enthusiasm of a few men overcoming all obstacles to create something international and world class. Eventually though, both dock and city fell into decline until finally the old dock was wiped off the map, buried and forgotten. And it's only now, in the first few years of the 21st century, that the dock is beginning to take centre stage once more as Liverpool embraces a new era, this time as an international city of culture. Watch clips from tonight's Time Team and relive moments from past episodes at channel4.com slash tvclips. Next up, a young woman is hearing a man's voice telling her to do things. The doctor who hears voices.